Hey guys, welcome to Radius Church Online. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us this morning and happy Easter. What a great Sunday, uh, a time to celebrate and we are just so happy that you are here with us this morning. Uh, man, Radius Church is really starting to ramp up after our long shutdown. Lots of so many exciting things happening and we wanna make sure that you know what's going on. We have a vision night coming up on April 25th. We have water baptisms right around the corner. Um, and we have a new set of life groups, a very interesting new take on life groups. So make sure to stay tuned for information about that. If you wanna keep up to date, make sure to tune in every Monday morning at 10 a.m. to The Circle. That drops on YouTube, our Facebook, all of our online platforms, and Jake will fill you in on everything going on during the week. Also, we have our weekly email that goes out. It goes out every Wednesday at 10 a.m. If you want to get on that list, make sure to go to radiuschurch.tv and fill out a connection card. You'll get all that information delivered to your inbox every single week. We've been on a series called Billboard Hits. We're on part number three this week, and Pastor Ken is speaking on the prodigal son. It's one of his all-time favorite Bible stories and one of my all-time favorite messages. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear it. You're in for a treat. Here's Ken with part number three of Billboard Hits. Come on, it's Easter. You can do better. Yeah. Well, we're on a series that I resurrected, one that I preached before called Billboard Hits. And it's just our take of taking what Jesus did and he took uh, stories and, and he mixed it with a truth uh, and we call them parables. Parable comes from the word parabola. Parabola means to bring alongside of. So Jesus would often take stories and bring alongside of it a truth. And so we are just attempting to do the same thing with some of my favorite songs. It's a little bit different take on the Easter message. But one of my biggest fears as a pastor is that we come year in and year out and year in and year out and we hear, and I mean no disrespect, about the stone that's been rolled away and that's great. And without it, we wouldn't be here today. But sometimes you, when you hear a story over and over, if we don't mean to, but we can become a little bit calloused or, or we eliminate some of the emotion behind it. And so I love this song. I'm going to speak to you from, I think, my very favorite Bible story this weekend. Welcome all of you that are watching online. So glad. Just let us know where you're watching from. We have noticed there's a lot of people watching from different states. Put it in the chat. Where are you from? We've been regularly having folks from Michigan and Florida and Arizona. So let us know you're with us on this Resurrection Sunday. The song was released on March the 9th, 1987. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. It skyrocketed to the Billboard hits off the album, The Joshua Tree. And some of the lines that we just had you sing are some of my favorite lyrics in any song. It was originally written to be a gospel song. And some of the lyrics say, I have spoke with the tongues of angels. I have held the hand of of the devil, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. That may make a little more sense as we get into the message a little bit. I like the last verse. It says, you broke the bonds and you loosed the chains. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. You carried the cross of all my shame, of all my shame, and you know I believe it, but some still haven't found what they're looking for. Let's pray and see what God would say to us tonight. So Father, in the next few minutes that we spend in this place and in this space, I pray God that you would just allow your Holy Spirit to interpret this message into everybody's understanding. Whatever our paradigms, whatever our backgrounds are, I pray that we would see you different. We would see you madly in love with us. A God that's running after us. I pray that tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me start off with a few questions. How many of you, by a show of hands, all right, how many of you have ever uh, been lost? Let me see your hands. Come on, let me see your hands. That's interesting. Come on, raise them up. If you, I had to ask twice because women raise their hand right away, but men are hesitant because men never like to admit they're lost. Come on, right, men? 
right? Aren't, aren't you, men, aren't you glad for GPS because now we don't ever have to fake like we're not lost, right? Thank you, Jesus, for GPS. But uh, I was 18 years old, and I was working on the loading docks in Memphis, Tennessee, and a friend of mine always drove me to work because he worked there too, and I rode home with them. But my last week of the job, I had to go pick up my paycheck at an odd time, and I drove down into the... Now, if you've ever been to Memphis, all of Memphis is a bad area, okay? And, and, and so I drove down to there to get my paycheck, got my paycheck, and took a wrong turn, and I was stopped at a stop sign, and I was looking at... Um, some of you won't know what these are, uh, but I was looking at uh, an old-fashioned map, like a paper map, you know? How many remember those? You, you, you know, it wasn't real easy, like somebody talking to you where to turn. It was like, unfold it and unfold. And before you know it, it's taken up the whole car. Oh, here I am, right? And, and by the time I was like, oh, I, I, I zigged when I should have zagged. And, and, and I started folding it up. And I looked out my windshield, and my car was surrounded. And no kidding, I, I, there had to at least be 20 gang members around my car. My spidey senses went straight up because I knew they weren't ready to invite me to church. How many know what I'm saying, right? And I, I'm just telling you, I don't know what happened, but I hit the gas and I took off. I remember seeing guys flying, rolling over my hood. I don't know what happened to them. I didn't stop to pray for them. Father, forgive me, but I got out of there. Okay, if you haven't ever been lost, how many of you have ever lost something? Come on, you've lost something. How many of you lost something today? Anybody at all, right? <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, there, there you are. If you've ever lost something, I started going to church uh, somewhere around six years old, and somewhere around seven or eight, I don't know exactly, um, we, me and my little sister, we would ride uh, the church. We called it the church bus, but it was really just a glorified church van. And we would ride the church van to church. And when I got my sister to start coming with me, um, my mom told me, whatever you do, boy, don't you lose your sister. The joys of being the oldest. How many know the pain? You know what I'm saying? I, I, I mean, it was like at, at that age, seven years old, it felt like a threat. Like, don't you even think about coming home if you lose your sister, right? And so church was over. It's like, oh, so you lose her and you don't want me? You know, so church is over and I couldn't find my sister. And I'm terrified because I can see, I know it didn't happen this way, but how many know in a seven-year-old's mind, it was like, boy, the last thing you better do. You know what I'm talking about? Like, she's going to bodily hurt me if I come home without my sister. And so I couldn't find my sister, and so I had this bright idea. I'm not exaggerating this story one bit. I thought to myself, I said, well, I know that guy that we call pastor. He always goes up to the stage, and he bends the microphone down. You know, the old squeaky kind of microphone. How many have been in church long enough to know what it's like, and, and he'll bend it down, and he'll start yelling, and people respond. I thought, well, I could do that because my life is on the line. And so I remember walking up on that teal shag carpet, getting up by the pulpit. I was, really wasn't tall enough, so I stood beside it, and I yelled out, Has anyone seen my sister? With tears in the whole thing. And I really think that's where God called me into ministry. <laughs> I, I really, because I've been doing the same thing every weekend since. How many know what I'm saying, right? But, uh, but, but some of us have lost some things that are a lot more serious than that. Some of us have lost some things that uh, it still hurts. We've lost family members. We've lost, some of us have lost spouses uh, because of divorce. We've lost things that are more severe. Some have lost love, and there's nothing like a lost love. Some are even here, and the year 2020 was a final straw, and maybe you've lost hope. But believe it or not, everybody, God knows the feeling of what it is to lose something. He knows the pain of what it is to lose somebody that He loves. He knows what it is to have close relationship and for that relationship to fall apart. Let me explain it a little bit to you. Most of you know the Bible story of creation. I'll just hit some high spots here. Um, but God created man 
And when he created man, he created man, watch this, in his image. He created, he created man in his image. How I many know, at least know that's true, right? That he created him in his image. And, and it's another way of saying, when you really dig into that word, it's almost like saying that that man was supposed to mirror the image of God. So let me say it one way. I'll be God in heaven. I'll be king in heaven. You be king of the earth. I'll be Lord in heaven, you be Lord of the earth. Therefore, you be, I'll be Lord of lords and King of kings. And, and, and you will reflect my image, you will reflect my character on the earth. You will have authority on the earth. You'll have dominion on the earth. You will represent, represent me and my heart on the earth. And the Bible says something interesting, and, and I've never really been able to totally wrap my mind around the theology of this, but this is what the Bible says. The Bible said that in the cool of the evening, God would come down. I, I don't even know what that looks like, right? I, 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 I mean... I just don't. And, 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 and it says that God would come down in the cool of the evening and some translations say fellowship or walk with or be with Adam. Come on, everybody. That's, that's like a cool, crazy story. That in the cool... Can you imagine after dinner, you're hanging out on the front porch drinking lemonade and here comes God. Tony, let's roll, man. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that, that's what the Bible says, that God would come down in the cool of the evening and fellowship with Him. And I wonder if maybe the Easter message, because we know the rest of the story, we know that something interfered with that relationship, with that evening time, if you would, that evening time intimacy. Something messed with it. And so I just wonder, if we, couldn't, if we couldn't point at the Easter message, maybe from a little different perspective this weekend, I wonder if the Easter message is a little bit more about finding something that was lost. I wonder, let me say it another way, I wonder if the Easter message, when we boil it all down, when we get through all this stuff, if we boiled it down to God is trying to save something that was lost. Because something interrupted their relationship, and the Easter message is about God loving us so much that He comes to restore that relationship, that fellowship that He desires to have with His creation. Come on, everybody, right? And so Genesis 2.17, I won't get too into this, but in Genesis 2.17, God says something powerful to His creation, to Adam and Eve. He says to Adam, He says, look, I've given you this whole garden, and it's utopia, it's perfect. I mean, it's roses with no thorns. Come on, everybody. It's a beautiful garden with no mosquitoes. Can I get an amen, right? It's watermelon with no seeds, all right? It's just this perfect world. There's no sickness, there's no heartache, there's no pain. It's the king king of kings and the lord of lords adam is having dominion down there but genesis 2 17 and i don't have it on the screen tonight but on genesis 2 17 god says something to adam that is powerful he said if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will surely die that's such a powerful thing and some have asked me over the years, well, why in the world would God put that tree in the garden anyway? Why would He give man the opportunity to mess up anyway? Because one of the greatest gifts that God gave us was a, our own will. So that we have the ability to choose, am I going to walk with Him in the cool of the evening? Am I going to hang out with Him? Am I going to have relationship with Him? If He didn't give us the option to say no, then forced love, how many know, is not really love at all? And so, you know the story. Adam and Eve took the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and right then, sin entered into the world. Now, our bodies began to die. That's why we get old. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. That's why we lose our hair. Thank you very much, Adam. That's why our bodies begin, our bodies at that moment, our bodies were created to live forever, but in that moment, our bodies began to die. Sickness entered in. Death entered in. Disease entered in. Come on, everybody. Pandemics entered in, right? That moment right there when Adam and Eve took the forbidden fruit, you will surely die. Their bodies died, began to die, their spirit man died immediately. 
That's why later on in John 3, 3, we hear Jesus teaching Nicodemus, who was the greatest Bible scholar of his time. He told Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because all of us are born into this world spiritually dead, and that's why when we become followers of Christ, we become born again. And, and one of the most powerful verses, I preached it before on Easter, but let me just reminisce it just for a moment. So now I want you to go back to God coming down in the cool of the evening to walk in fellowship with Adam. And he gets to their designated spot, but Adam's not there. And for the first time in the creation of the world, the master of the universe asks a question. I just have to imagine that heaven stood still, that God, the sum total of every equation, the answer to every question is now asking a question, Adam, where are you? If you were here last week, it's kind of like the story of Hosea and Gomer. Where are you? And, and it wasn't, watch this, it wasn't that God couldn't see through trees. It wasn't that God didn't know where he was geographically. Come on, any parents in here ever ask your kids, what have you gotten into? It, it was like God was saying, what have you gotten into? See, I created you to look like me down there, but you've gotten into something that doesn't look like me. Ah, it, you, you no longer, there's something between us now. There's something, watch this, that's been lost. And if we speed and, and we hurry through the Old Testament, we will find that God made a solution, though it be, a, 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 I'm going to just say for this message, a temporary solution, and that he sacrificed an animal. He clothed Adam and Eve with the skin or the fur of the animal, and, and, and the blood was sacrificed. Why? Because God is a God of his word. Genesis 2.17, if you do this, you will surely die. In other words, there was death was the requirement for disobedience. And so animals sacrificed so that man, humans, could walk uh, innocent before God. And that's the Old Testament. As fast as I can go through it, that sets up this story. But if you listen real carefully, if you listen real carefully, all through the Old Testament, all of us, we, we, mankind ha, has an IOU on their life. Their, their sins are forgiven, but for a season, but then again they have to sacrifice again, and they have to sacrifice again. And the relationship with God is not all that it could be. Now watch this. I could almost hear God. This is my Easter message, so I'm going to preach it a little bit different. But I could almost hear God through the hallways of the Old Testament singing, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for, right? I mean, I can see him. Yeah, I've got you in place. I've got you in position, but it's really not all that I want it to be. I've given you some laws, and you're obeying some laws to stay in relationship with me, but it's not really what I intended. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And so you know the story. You've at least, even if you don't attend church very often, you know the reason we're here this weekend. God comes to earth. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And what is He doing? God strips Himself of deity, puts on humanity. Remember Hosea last week? Walking through the dusty streets of this earth to look for that which He has lost. Isn't it great that, that, you know, people call Christianity a religion. I would argue that it's not a religion because every religion in the world is telling you how to get to God. Aren't you glad today to be blood-bought Christians? This is not a religion that we don't have to get our way to God, but God came and He found His way to us. Come on, man. Right? Right? And so God leaves heaven to come down. Adam, to answer his own question, where are you? What have you gotten into? You don't look like me anymore. And there's something called sin between us, and now I can't find my love. I, I, I can't find my relationship. And so he comes, and Luke 19 tells us this way. Luke 19 says, For the Son of Man came, to seek and to save that which was lost. Man, I don't, I, I, come on, some of you haven't been in church a while, and, and I want you to know you can still say amen through those masks. 
He came to seek. He didn't just stumble like, well, I hope I find. No, no. He came with a search party. He came to seek. He looked for your address. He looked for your sin. He looked for your shortcoming. He looked for your hurt. He looked for your pain. He looked for your prayer. He looked for you. He came to seek and to save. Come on, everybody. Which brings me to Luke chapter number 15. I love Luke chapter 15. You've probably heard, never heard Luke chapter 15 preached on Easter, but welcome to Radius, everybody. We see Jesus. In Luke 15, it opens up and we see Jesus. Watch, I love this because remember, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And he leaves heaven, comes to earth, and, and he's, he's on the earth. His ministry has started. Luke 15. And where do we find Jesus? Not in the temple, not in the churches, not in life groups. Where do we find Jesus? Hanging out with the sinners. He's hanging out with the sinners. Luke 15 says he's hanging out with the sinners and the tax collectors. And, 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 and here, maybe it, it, we find Jesus finally finding what he was looking for. We, we find Jesus finally discovering this is what I've been looking for. Because the sinners weren't uncomfortable with Jesus. The sinners were sitting with him. In fact, Luke 15, if you read it, it says that he was sitting with the sinners and the tax collectors. I always find it interesting that we had to divide the sinners and the tax collectors. Sometimes I have those same feelings. How many of you know what I'm saying, right? It's the sinners, and, and it's almost like this other group, like, like, like this other group that, well, there's the sinners, and then there's, you know, there's those guys. You, you know what I mean? I mean, we've never done that. But it's like the sinners who Jesus can save, but then there's that other group. And have you ever noticed every generation has a tax collector group? We, we like to talk about how big God's grace is for the sinners, but then there's that one generation. And every generation has had a label for the tax collectors. I remember being a little boy, my mom was divorced, and I literally remember her telling the story that someone from the church had said because she was divorced, she would never go to heaven. So it was the sinners and the divorcees. In our world that we've lived in, it's been the sinners and the... You can put the label on it. We always have this one group that we think His grace is not big enough for. Come on. But this is, radius is not the open circle. Heaven is an open circle. And His grace is sufficient for the sinners and the tax collector. Come on now, right? And, and here's how Luke 15 opens up. So Luke 15 opens up. He's sitting with the sinners and the tax collectors. And I would submit that he's finally found what he's looking for. He's, he's, he's looking for those that are distant and afar off. And they know they're afar off. And the Bible says that, that, that the religious suchy-muchies show up. Well, the Bible doesn't say the word suchy-muchy. That was my interpretation. It says the, the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law showed up. And the Bible says this, and I'm trying really hard not to read all of Luke 15 because it's dangerous when you preach your favorite chapter because you want to go off on every sentence. And it says they murmured against Jesus. They murmured. They complained that, that he claims to be the Son of God, yet he's hanging out with sinner, or yeah, he's hanging out with sinners and tax collectors, and, and if I could add, and they feel okay about it. And he feels okay about it. And they began to complain. So Jesus, instead of arguing with them, man, Jesus is the man. Instead of arguing with them, instead of fighting on Facebook with them. Instead of tweeting about what he disagrees with them. Come on now. He don't even start preaching. He doesn't bust out theology on them. He doesn't say, well, my church believes in. No, no, he doesn't do any of that. He says, let me tell you a story. And he tells a story, a parable. Luke 15. And it's the story of three lost things. And I want to touch on them really quick today. A little bit lengthy scripture reading, but let's look at it. Luke chapter number 15, verses number 4 through 10. So Jesus looks at him and he says, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. 
Whew, that's good so far. Let's see. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Watch this, verse 8. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Ooh, I love this story. Uh, I love it because it tells me heaven's going to be a party. How many know? Heaven's not afraid of party. One person gets saved, heaven throws a party. I love that. Come on now. All of you ex-partiers ought to be really amening right now. Hey, Radius Church, I just want to interrupt the message here real quick. I'm actually working on getting the live stream video all set up to go for Easter morning, but just wanted to interrupt real quick. I'm actually going to take you over to Mark Evans, our life groups pastor, as he has got an important announcement for you guys regarding life groups. So check this out. One of our values at Radius is relationships. We really believe in doing life together and experiencing community. Church is so much more than simply coming to a weekend service and hearing a great message. It's really about being connected with people. And this has obviously been a unique time to create those connections. So we're doing something really fun. I'm excited about it. We're setting up what we're calling text groups. Now these groups will have a text captain and then a total of four other people and they will be gender specific. So there will be men's groups and there will be women's groups. And here's the idea behind this. Have you ever been going through a time in the week and it's just kind of like, man, I'd really like to be able to reach out to somebody and just say, hey, would you pray for me? Or, hey, here's some great things that are happening in my life. And, and just begin to take a little bit of a step in connecting some relationships. So over the next couple of weeks, we're giving you the opportunity to get connected in a text group. You can go to radiuschurch.tv. There's a text group button you can click. You can also fill out a card at church. And then over the next couple of weeks, we'll be putting these groups together. And then a text group captain will reach out to you, will welcome you into their group. I'm so excited about it. We're going to have fun, creative things. So from time to time, a text group captain might send out a, a question of the week or something to kind of ponder as you go about your week or ask you, hey, is there something I can be praying for you for? So I invite you, get connected to a text group and take a little bit of a step in building some relationships. Let's talk about these three lost things. That's all I have for you today. First of all, let's talk about the lost sheep because there's a reason why he's telling the story. But let's talk about the lost sheep real quick. The lost sheep. First of all, the sheep, he's lost. He knows he's lost and he's crying out for help. There are those that will hear me this weekend. There are those that are watching right now online that you're lost. You feel empty. You're distraught. This year of 2020 that we just got through, came through, you feel more lost than ever. When will life get back to normal? And you're coming into the realization that it's never going back to what we called normal. We just have to move on from here. And you feel lost. You're lost. You know you're lost. And you're crying out. Maybe it's why you've tuned in. Maybe it's why you've gathered for this weekend because you're lost you know you're lost and your actions are demonstrating that you're crying out for help i love i used to didn't like it but i love that jesus talk uses a sheep as an example i love that Be, because um he, he's he's basically comparing all of us to sheep and and i used to not like that uh, maybe it was my ego, maybe it was my insecurity, but like when Jesus were, like compares me to something, wouldn't anybody like to be something better than a sheep? Like I'd like to be a lion or an eagle, or you know what I mean, right? But he compares us to a sheep, and, 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 and the Scripture often does this. And I think, the script, I think he uses a sheep because maybe you can relate. Maybe it's not you, but you might know somebody that's just like a sheep. A, a sheep, a, a, a sheep um, is fearful. I, I mean, I know you're never fearful. Um, uh, I mean, minus 2020, but I mean, we're never fearful. 
A, a sheep is fearful. Uh, a sheep is fragile. Um, and you know what else? A sheep is forgetful. Have you ever met anything? God will deliver them from something, and a few months later, they are freaked out because they got to go through the same thing and forgot that God delivered them. Do you know anybody like that? They're just forgetful. They're so forgetful, they don't even know their way home. And they're so forgetful that Jesus knows that they need a shepherd because a shepherd knows that the sheep are forgetful and is willing to leave the 99 behind. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that he's willing to leave the 99 behind and come on out and find the one fearful, the one fragile, the one forgetful sheep that doesn't have it together like all the other. Ah, oh, come on, man. For the one fearful sheep, would you say Amen. Come on, on the chat, would you say amen? If you've, give me a little emoji of a sheep if you know what I'm talking about. right? It just For the one sheep that just forgets, oh yeah, he brought me through that. He hasn't brought me this far to leave me now. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. I forgot that he healed me. I forgot that he delivered me. I forgot the Easter message that he sent his only begotten son. And if he did that, what else do I have to worry about? But the reason he tells the story is not just for that. You see, the Pharisees could not fathom that the shepherd would go out for the sheep. They couldn't fathom that. It went against every kind of teaching. They thought it was stupid to leave the 99 behind and go find the one. See, the Pharisees didn't have any problem with that sheep that was lost to come groveling back to come with its ears tucked back, its tail tucked back, groveling, please take me back. I know I was fearful, and I'll do my penance, and I'll repent, and I'll, and, and, and I'll do all the whatever I have to do. And they had requirements for that. They had no problem with the sheep coming back, groveling in penance. But they had this crazy, misconstrued idea that God would leave heaven and He would come through our mess and our filth and our fears and our fragile and our forgetfulness and our mess-ups and come sit at a table with the tax collectors because He was coming to us looking for the things that He has lost. Come on, everybody, right? They couldn't see it. They, they, they couldn't see it. The line in the song, I have scaled these city walls only to be with you. I've left heaven. I've come through so much. They couldn't fathom that the glorious God would do that. See, they, 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 they seen His holiness, but they missed His love. Because His love caused Him to get dirty. Come on, aren't you glad He got dirty? He got, dirt. he got down in our mess to rescue us, everybody. And the Pharisees couldn't handle that. The lost coin. Let me talk to you about the lost coin. The lost sheep was lost. It knew it was lost, and it was crying out for help. But the lost coin was lost. It didn't know it was lost, and it didn't have a voice to cry out for help. Let me give you a little background. When a Jewish girl would get married, one of the things was their custom is that she was given a headband that she could wear, kind of like we wear rings today, a headband that she could wear that had ten silver coins, signifying that she was in a covenant relationship. Uh, come on, for the church folks, signifying that she was married, signifying that she was the bride and belonged to the groom. Come on, you know? And, 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 and so he picks up in the middle of this story, and he knows, and he says, suppose she lost one of the coins. It means something's wrong with the relationship. Something's wrong with the covenant, the promise. And, and so he tells this story. And I just want you to imagine, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but she begins to clean the house. The Bible says she would sweep the house. I imagine her rearranging the furniture. Come on, if you had a coin that meant that much, how many know you do a little rearranging to find that coin. And there are some people like the coin. You're lost. And you don't even realize, what, what is this emptiness in me? I don't even know who to cry out to. And so I would say it's not an accident that you found your place here, that you found yourself on this webpage watching this message today. Because you're recognizing, you're recognizing perhaps after all you've been through in the last few months, man, I'm lost I, I, I never knew there was anything to this God thing, but there's this emptiness in me. 
And, and, and I never knew God loved me so much. And I didn't realize the price that He paid to get me. And, 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 and nobody ever told me that where I'm at is not where I have to stay. And, and I'm just hearing it for the first time. But you're here today, and you're listening today, and you're hearing the song. You're hearing the story of Easter, how God so loved the world that He came. And, and, and He's looking for you, and He's longing for you, and He's searching for you. And if we could hear it, come on, we could hear God singing. And I still haven't found what I'm looking for. We can see Him. We, we can see Him in the dirty manger, leaving the royalty of heaven, being born in a manger to a teenage girl. They didn't, they didn't even have an end, but He's walking through the filth, not just of this earth, but the fallen world. He's walking through the places where I have messed up singing, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Oh, let me get you to the best part of the story. Because after the lost sheep and after the lost son, or excuse me, the lost coin, there's the lost son. And oh, the story takes a dramatic change right here. And we find out why Jesus is really telling this story. Oh, I love it. Let's go. I I'm going to fast forward all the way to Luke chapter 15, verse number 11. And, and Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. And, and the younger one said to his father, Father, Give me my share of the estate. So this is very important. Don't miss this. So he divided his property between them. Now, if you want to dig into that and read more, I encourage you to do that. But I want, I want to set the stage just a little bit. And, and, and what happened, basically the younger son was basically telling the father, I want nothing to do with you. You might as well drop dead. I want my inheritance now. And what we know through Jewish custom is we know that the older son would get two-thirds of the inheritance because the oldest son of the family always got a double portion of what everybody else got. And the younger son got one-third of the inheritance. And so let's look at the three characters of this story, and then I'll be done. First of all, I want to talk to you about the younger son. The younger son is very interesting, and, 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 and he's like, here's the reason Jesus is telling the story. Remember, he's sitting with the sinners and the tax collectors, so, so, so the younger son represents the sinners and the tax collectors, and, and he starts, he, he says, he, he's like them, and, and he, he takes his inheritance. He, he wants nothing to do with the father. He goes to a foreign land. You can read it in there. And he goes off, and he spends all of his money living frivolously, and, and he spends it on prostitutes, and he does all kind of wild living. And then a famine hits the land, and he finds himself in a pig pen. And here's where the story gets really interesting, because in verse number 17, we find that this, this boy has hit rock bottom. He's like the sinners and the tax collectors he's been very geographically distant from the father he's run from the father and and i love this part it's our prayer for you this weekend or anytime you ever tune in and watch this message i love this when he came to his senses can i paraphrase that when he came to his senses when i realized everything i had tried did not satisfy I've done everything that money could buy, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Oh, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Uh, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. The rest of the story says, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go, and I'm going to ask my father just to just to hire me. You see, he came to a conclusion. My father, he came, he came to the realization, I have a father who desires to bless me, who desires to love me, who desires to have a relationship with me, who desires for me to be in his presence, uh, who desires something that I've run from. Maybe I've come to my senses to realize I'm sick of being the victim and I'm ready to be the victor. I'm ready to walk in this grace that my Father is offering. Come on, everybody. <clears throat> I took my riches, I experienced everything. Come on, Bono, sing to us. I have climbed the highest mountains. I have scaled these city walls, but I still haven't found 
what I'm looking for. Let's talk about the older son. I'm going as fast as I can. Oh, you got to read chapter 15. The older son, oh, he's really the reason the story's even being told. See, it's heartwarming, and we church folks often hear about the prodigal son coming home. It's very heartwarming. Better preachers than me have got up and preached the prodigal son home. I, I, I mean, and the choir sings about the time he comes down that dusty road. And, and, and blessed assurance plays about the time the prodigal son comes back to the father. And everybody, woo, it's good. Cue the music. Let the credits roll. This is a great love story. But the reason Jesus is telling the story, uh, the reason he's telling the story is not for the immoral outsider. He's telling the story for the moral insiders. He's telling the story for all of those that think that their rules and their religion and their legalism uh, and, and, and all their churchy suchy muchy has got them favor with the Father. He's telling the story because the older son thinks he has more in with the father than the younger son. But I would submit to you that they're both equally as distant from the father. One might be geographically distant, but their hearts are equally distant from the father. Oh man, uh, it's heartwarming to hear that. But the oldest son, he, I, I want you to hear it. He's just as lost. And you know what? He's telling the story to tell the Pharisees, you're just as lost. You're mad at me and murmuring because I'm sitting here with sinners and tax collectors. You're just as lost. You look better. You dress better. You say scriptures. You sing churchy songs. You, you got a Christian bumper sticker on your car, but you're just as lost. Whoa, I didn't come here for Easter to hear that. Just as lost. Because religion doesn't get your heart right with the Father. Attending church doesn't get your heart right with the Father. Come on now. The, the younger son, I mean the older son, he might as well have been singing the song too. I have spoke with the tongues of angels. I can hear the younger son tuning in. And I have held the hand of the devil. And both of them in choir singing, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. See, he mistakenly thought that he had, watch this, had earned and deserved something from the Father because of his good behavior. He thought, if I have my Sunday school perfect attendance record, then when I ask the Father for something, he must do what I've asked him to do because I have followed all of the rules. Ha, <laughs> ha. Ooh, and I think that, I think the older son has created more damage to the father's family than any prodigal son has ever created. It's that such a much, I have no sin in my life. You think I'm exaggerating in the story, but isn't it interesting that when Jesus was teaching, he usually offended the religious and usually drew to him the sinners? Woo! It makes me feel I gotta go back and read this story every time churchy people get mad at me. <laughs> Jesus attracted the younger son and got the older sons mad. Now, now before we go to the last person in the story, I want you to notice some lies that were told by the older son. Check this out in verse number 29. Now the son, the younger son comes home, the father's excited. We'll talk about that in a minute. The father throws a party. Many of you know that part of the story. The older son refuses to go into the party. The father comes out and pleads with him, the Bible says. What is the deal? And the older son says this. See if you can't pick up the lies. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Uh, here's your clue. They're in yellow words, all right? And I've never disobeyed. I, I'm sorry. I know I shouldn't say this in church. I already want to choke this boy out. I have never disobeyed. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay, I'm sorry. I've never disobeyed. Yet you never get. There's another lie. You never gave me even a young goat. Remember when we opened the story? There was a father. He had two sons. And he divided his inheritance amongst them. 
Mm. Let, let me, I just got to hit on these real quick. First of all, this word slaving really bothers me. It doesn't just bother me in the story. It bothers me when I see churchgoers with an attitude of slaving. Well, I have to pay my tithes. Well, I have to go to church. I have to do my... It's like we're a slave. Like, I have to. And, and, and when we turn this beautiful relationship into a have to, into a slave thing, into these are the things I have to do to earn the favor of the Father, then we've missed the mark. Jesus says we are no longer slaves but he calls us sons and when you understand that you've been adopted by the father that he's come and he's searched for you you no longer have to now you get to come on everybody I don't have to pray I get to pray I don't have to praise I get to applaud him I get to I'm not a slave I'm a son everybody come on now I'm a son and then he says, and then if that way, like he didn't get the Father's attention, and I never disobeyed you. Man, I, I'm so, I just want to punch him in the nose. I never sinned. Have you ever met somebody like that? They wouldn't say it, but you know they act like it. You know, they say things like, I don't know how they could do that. Huh? Well, but by the grace of God, you got saved before sin had a chance to incubate as long as it did. In other words, you got saved and you got pulled out of the oven before you came into full whatever you were going to be. Never did so. I don't know how people could do that. I don't know how a mother could do that. Don't, that, that's the older brother piety acting like, uh, I don't know how they, they could ever do that. But 1 John 1.8 says something to us. It says this, if we say we have no sin, we've deceived ourselves. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. i got to hurry this up. And the last lie he tells is, you never gave me anything. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I'm going to propose something to you here. I shouldn't do this. Oh, I shouldn't do this, but I like this. Did you notice when the sheep was lost, somebody searched for the sheep. When the coin was lost, somebody searched for the coin. But when the son was lost, nobody went and looked for the son. I'm going to present something to you that I think. The older son had two-thirds of the inheritance. He had all the resources he needed. And the older son, the church son, the well-behaved son, should have been the one that was going out and looking for the younger son. I'm going to tell you something else. I think I can't prove it in Scripture, so you can spit this part out. But I wonder sometimes if the younger son didn't leave in the first place because he was sick of the attitude. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. That, that, that heresy, I don't know. It's just my thought. It's just my thought. It's just my thought. Uh, but I just wonder... In real life, have we ever pushed some to the pig pen because of the piety? Let's do the last character and you'll be on your way. The father. Oh, the father is the greatest part. The father had lost his son. Now, I brought in a chair today because I just want, I'm going to read one verse to you and I'm going to sit down, not because I'm tired, but... Um, I was just thinking, I, I know this story happened in the Middle East, and, and I understand the customs of the time. But I like to imagine the story the way I want to imagine the story. And, 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 and the setting really is irrelevant for the truth, because it's a parable. So I like to imagine an old ranch hand father. Okay, it's my story. You can make your father whatever you need him to be. And, and the Bible says something very interesting. See, the, the father, I picture the father, not even in a chair like this, I kind of picture him on an old ranch, on an old wooden porch with an old rocking chair or a porch swing. And ever since younger son left, I imagine the father sitting on the porch watching. That's how I imagine. I brought my little pocket knife tonight even and because I imagine him whittling. I don't know, I just imagine that's what old guys do. Maybe I need the practice. I don't know. <laughs> and I could almost hear, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I, 
I, I have a feeling he never took his eye off the road that came home. I have scaled these city walls, these city walls, but I still, Adam, where art thou? Haven't found. Wait, wait, wait. He's not just looking to the side where the younger son is. Oh, no. That would make the story incomplete. The younger son's very distant. But the older son is right here. I have spoke with tongues of angels. I have run mm -hmm, only to be with you, but I still haven't found. And the Bible says something so powerful. I close with a couple of thoughts that I don't want to lose you on. So let's go back to the younger son for just a moment. The younger son, remember he says, he says, I'm going to go back to my father and I'm going to repent and I'll be glad if he just lets me be a servant in his home. I'll repent, I'll grovel, I'll do what the Pharisees and the older brothers expect me to do. And I still, and I can just imagine as his feet would hit the dusty path to the road coming home, little poofs of <laughs> dust. I don't know why, that's what I see. And I think the father, but I still, and the Bible says something so powerful. To me, it's the greatest Easter verse ever. It's found in verse number 20. Check it out. So he got up and went to his father. father but while he was still a long way off. How, how did we know he was a long way off? Because the father never got his eye off the road. His father, but I still haven't found. He was a long way. While he was, a, aren't you glad God found you when you were a long way off? Aren't you glad you didn't have to get close? You didn't have to get clean. You didn't have to get it together. You didn't have to get churchy. You didn't have to get righteous. You didn't have to get washed up, cleaned up, talked up, walked up. You didn't have to. But while you were a long, don't act like you weren't a long way off because I know some of you and you were a long way off. And the Father found you while you were a long way, while you were still cussing Him, he, while, you were, while you were still dripping with the pods of the pigs. He found you. Come on, Tony. He found you. Am I right about it? Yeah, He found you. Some of you, He went to prison to find you. Some of them, He went to drug rehabs to find you. Some of you, He went to betrayal and pain and hurt, but He found you. He went through all of it because He had to answer the question, Adam, where are you? That's the Easter message. I have found. I'm running after the thing that I'm looking for. And He's running after after you come on somebody wow because he was filled with compassion and he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him and oh oh just for a little more time notice at the end of this parable at the end of all these parables watch this all of the all the lost things uh, everything after it was found there was a party thrown afterwards and and really you think Sorry with the same illustration, but you would think that the father runs to him. And he wraps his arm around him. And you would think right there, oh, the, the music begins to fade in. The lights begin to fade down. The credits begin to roll. It's a Hollywood movie, everybody. And instead of I still haven't found what I'm looking for, they're singing something like, cool in the gang, celebrate good times. I don't know. My son is coming. That's the quickest I could come up with something. And you would think that's how the story would end. Celebration. Kill the fatted calf. Get a robe for my son. Put a ring of authority back on him. Cover him in my righteousness and take this heaviness off of him. Bring him in to the father. Kill the fatted calf. And the credits would roll. Oh, what a celebration. Everyone is celebrating except the older son is still outside of the party. Watch what happens. I won't read it to you. First of all, dignified fathers didn't run to their sons. 
That's something that children did. It was humbling for a Middle Eastern man to take up his, whatever you call his clothes, and, and, and run to his son. That was humbling. It was humiliating for him to run. Only children ran. It was undignified, but he ran. Watch this. It's also humbling for the Lord of the manor to have to go outside of the party and plead with the older son, please, come into the party. And the story ends the same way the story begins. But I still haven't found. I know you're religious. I know you wear a cross. I know you know a lot of Bible verses. But do you know me? Will you come in and celebrate with me? Will you come and huddle up in this big feast of grace? Your brother has come home. And unfortunately, the story ends with the same song. But I still. So my question as I end tonight, what son are you? What son are you? Today, are you the son he's looking for and longing for? Or are you the son that he's pleading with and begging? Please come on in. Please step over all that righteous, self-righteous stuff. Please come on in. Please come on in. What son are you? Let's pray together with heads bowed and eyes closed all over this place. Father, I thank you for your powerful word. I thank you for your message to us tonight. I I thank you so much, Lord, for what this weekend represents. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who came running for us. Thank you for your son, Jesus, that ran past all of my sins and all of my mess-ups. Thank you for your son, Jesus, that ran if I was the only one to find a relationship with me. Thank you that you ran past death and hell and the grave. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe you're listening to me online and maybe you're even in this room right now. You're not a follower of Jesus. Maybe you don't have this kind of relationship. Maybe you identify with one of the two sons. And if you don't, that means, man, you're in this grace-filled relationship with God and we applaud you and heaven is happy. But could you be the son that needs to come home? Or could you be the son that needs to get past all your self-righteousness and all these works of uh, of religion? The, The Father is longing and looking for you to have a relationship, a heart relationship. Say, maybe you've never heard that before. And maybe a church has messed that up for you. But if you're here, I want you to know, if you're listening online, I want you to know it's real simple. The Bible says this, that if we'll confess with our mouth that He is Lord and believe in our heart that He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And in just a moment in this room, I'm going to ask everyone in this whole audience to pray this prayer with me. And if you're watching online, I don't, you, you might be watching this live. You might have stumbled on this months from when I preached it, but it's no accident that God is using this to call you home right now. And so we're going to pray this prayer. And before I do, I want to know with heads bowed and eyes closed, I won't embarrass anybody. I won't bring anybody forward. But if you're in the room and you say, hey, Ken, I want to be in that prayer. I want to become a follower of Christ. I want to understand God's plans and purposes for my life. I don't even know all the things it means to be a son. I don't know what it means to be a follower of Christ, but I feel Him drawing me to take that first step and get on the journey to discover His plans for my life. If that's you, all over this room, I won't call you out. You just slip your hand up. Just, that's, that's me. God bless you, my friend. God bless you. Is there anybody else? Anybody else in this room says, that's me. I need it. Yep, buddy, great move. Love you, buddy. Thank you so much. Anybody else? We're going to say this prayer. If you're watching online, when we get done praying, there's a little box there that you can click a little hand that'll virtually raise, and we'll send you some information. But I want everybody in this place, come on, everybody, it's Easter weekend. Let's say this prayer. Let's say it with some vigor and boldness. Come on, repeat it with me. Father God, thank you for Jesus. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. Come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior and my best friend. From this day forward, I'm going to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. And the Bible says even heaven celebrates when one sinner. Come on, everybody.